happened in your past. God's love for you goes beyond any kingdom that you may have belonged to before you came to know Him. God's love for you goes beyond every fault and every failure, every time you've stumbled and fallen, every time you've given into that temptation, every time sin has knocked at your door and you've opened the door. God's love for you goes even beyond that. I'm talking about a beautiful grace that reaches to the heart and soul of humanity. Think about the love of God. Think about the love that David must have had for this boy, Mephibosheth, that he would call to him. Because rightfully so, shouldn't Mephibosheth have been sitting on the throne? He was the remaining heir of the first king, King Saul. And so David could have looked at him as an enemy and said, if I bring that boy into my house, he's going to try to take over. Somebody's going to try to establish him as king. He's going to try to take the throne away from me. But David did not do that. David looked beyond every situation and possibility. And he said, he is worth redeeming and I'm going to show him grace. I'm going to show him kindness. I'm going to show him love. The scripture says that he showed him great love, but he brought him close. He brought him out of exile. Second Samuel chapter nine, verse five says, then King David sent and brought him out of the house of Machir, the son of Amiel from Lodabar. David sent a messenger and said, bring him to me. Now, I don't know about you, but if I would have been Mephibosheth, I would have been like, oh, heck no. I ain't going. I know what waits for me if I go see King David. He's going to put a sword through my belly. And I can't run away. I'm crippled. But the scripture says that David sent and brought him to him. David sent and had him brought close, had him brought near. I think this is such a powerful commentary on what David was about to do in this young man's life. David didn't say, hey, take him some money so that he can take care of himself and David leave him over there in exile. David said, that's not good enough. I don't want to be separated from him. I'm going to love him just like I love Jonathan. I'm going to show him the same kind of unconditional love that his father Jonathan and I used to have. I want to bring him close. You see, when, when you're establishing relationship and fellowship, you have to come close to one another. You have to get in proximity of one another. And David sent and brought him out of the house of Machir. This is such a powerful statement because here was Mephibosheth in exile, alone, isolated, afraid for his life, absolutely lost. And David said, you're not going to be lost anymore. You're not going to be alone anymore. You're not going to be exiled anymore. I'm going to bring you close. I'm going to bring you into the presence of the king and things are about to change in your life. Listen to what Listen to what Ephesians chapter 2 verses 11 through 13 says. It says, therefore, remember that you, once Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision made in the flesh by hands, that at one time you were without Christ being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel. You were strangers from the covenants of the promise, having no hope and without God in the world. Sounds a little bit like Mephibosheth in that, during that time. Lost and without hope or without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once afar off have been brought near by the blood of Jesus Christ. You see where I'm going here? It doesn't matter how far you may feel like you are away from God. It doesn't matter how the enemy may feel like, make you feel like you're exiled or estranged from God. God sent his son Jesus and by the blood of Jesus we are brought near. We are no longer alone. We are no longer strangers. We are no longer exiled. We're no longer lost in sin. We're no longer without hope because God sent Jesus and he brought us near. He brought us near. You see there's something about being near the king that really changes everything. 
I think that's why Psalm chapter 91 tells us he that dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. He that dwells in the secret place. you got to get close to somebody to get in their secret place. You have to be close to them for them to allow you access. But the Word of God tells us that when Jesus died on the cross, that in the moment he gave up the ghost, that in the temple the veil was torn in two from the bottom to the top, and God was saying I'm opening it up and I'm drawing you close you're no longer strangers to me you're no longer exiled you see in the garden of Eden we gave up our right to the fellowship of God we gave up our right to the kingdom of God we were exiled into sin original sin came in and we were separated from God but God in his beautiful grace God saw us right where we were and he said you're not going to be estranged from me anymore you're not going to be isolated from me anymore I'm making a way for you to come back for you to receive forgiveness and redemption and healing See, he brought him close, but he also took away his death sentence. He took away Mephibosheth's death sentence. You see, one Mephibosheth got the death sentence. The other one was rescued from the death sentence. The scripture says in chapter 9, verse 6 through 7 of 2 Samuel, Now when Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, had come to David, he fell on his face and prostrated himself. Then David said, Mephibosheth. And he answered, Here is your servant. For David said to him, Do not fear, for I will surely show you kindness for your father Jonathan's sake. And I will restore to you all the land that Saul, of Saul, your grandfather, and you shall eat bread at my table continually. This is such a beautiful picture of grace. He removed the judgment. He wiped away the death sentence of Mephibosheth's life. Mephibosheth said, who am I that you would even take the time to consider such a dead dog as I. Mephibosheth knew he was a dead man. He knew it. It was just a matter of time. And yet David removed that and restored to Mephibosheth everything that had been lost. You see, we, we lost so much in the Garden of Eden. When Adam and Eve were deceived and they plunged us into original sin and it came into the picture and we were exiled from God's presence. Not just the Garden of Eden, but from his presence completely. I don't deserve this kindness. I don't deserve this beautiful grace. Romans chapter 6, verse 23 says, For the wages of sin is death. Y'all, we all had a death sentence. We were Mephibosheth. We were crippled by our sin. We were crippled by our past. We were crippled by things in our lives. And we were headed straight towards death. For the wages of sin is death, he said. But the gift of God. This beautiful gift of grace. This grace of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. For you see, the word of God tells us in Ephesians chapter 2, for by grace you have been saved. It is the gift of God, by grace. I don't know if the weight of the judgment of your sin has ever laid heavy upon you, but I understand the death sentence that was on my life. I understand that had it not been for Calvary, I would be lost. Had it not been that God extended his grace to me, I would still be in the house of Makir in Lodabar, lost and undone and afraid. And yet God sent his son to draw me close and to forgive me 
and to redeem me. And he took my death sentence on himself when they nailed him to the cross and they pierced his side and he gave his life. That should have been me. And yet he took away my death sentence. And he has provided everything I need. We see this beautiful picture of grace and that David didn't just tell Mephibosheth, I forgive you. I just want you to know I forgive you. I loved your, your father, Jonathan. I hope you have a good life. See ya. No. In 2 Samuel chapter 9, verse 9, it says, And the king called to Ziba and said to Saul's servant, I have given to your master's son, Mephibosheth, all the things that belong to Saul. Rightfully, those were David's things, because David was now king. And all of the things that had belonged to Saul, the palaces, the homes, the horses, the chariots, everything now belonged to David. And yet David said, I am giving all of that, everything that belonged to Saul, I'm giving to Mephibosheth. I'm giving it to him. He doesn't deserve it. He's not worthy of it. But in my eyes, he has become worthy because of the love that I had for Jonathan. He said to him, you therefore... Ziba and your sons and your servants shall work the land for him and you shall bring in the harvest that your master's son may have food to eat but Mephibosheth will eat at my table continuously see you see what David did here he set this boy up for the rest of his life to live a life of abundance to live a life of abundance Mephibosheth, who woke up one morning exiled in the house of Machir in Lodabar, went to sleep the next night in the palace of King David with all of the wealth of King Saul and all of the possessions that had been taken away from him. They were all given back to him because of the love and the grace that David extended to him. And not only that, David, David said, I'm going to make sure that you're taken care of for the rest of your life. Because you see this servant here named Ziba, you see all of his sons, and you see all of his servants, Mephibosheth, they're going to be out in your fields and your lands working for you. And they're going to bring in a harvest for you so that you, this investment continuously produces for you. And you always have what you need. Even after I'm gone, you'll have what you need. My God, can you imagine how that translates to us in our walk with God? Because when God calls us back from exile and we come to Calvary and he redeems us, he restores us, he makes us new, he makes us whole. And I want to tell you something, everything that the enemy took from you, God can give it back. Everything the enemy has tried to steal from you, God can restore it and put it back in your life. Everything that has been wiped away and seems to be gone, the grace of God can renew and restore. And here's the thing. Jesus said, I have come that you might have life and you might have it more abundantly. He didn't just come to be your salvation for today. He came to be your hope and your salvation and your strength for tomorrow. He came to give you a future. He came to give you a life of abundance. He didn't just save you today and then leave you to fend for yourself. He sent his Holy Spirit to fill your heart and strengthen you and empower you to go forward. And in the name of Jesus to destroy the works of the enemy. I want to know this morning, has anybody here experienced the beautiful grace of our Savior Jesus Christ? Has anybody been a recipient of this grace that is transforming our lives? How powerful that David would love this boy. But how much more powerful that Jesus would love me and you. How amazing that he showed us great love, that he drew us near to himself, that he broke the curse of sin and, and broke our death sentence. 
and how incredible that he's provided every single thing that we need in Jesus. David said that Mephibosheth will, will dwell in my house and he will eat at my table continuously, meaning he is now my son. He is now my boy. Listen, I want, I, it reminds me of another passage of Scripture that says, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for His name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for Thou art with me. Thy rod and Thy staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You cause me to eat at your table continuously, even though the enemy would accuse and blame me. You prepare the table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever because of the beautiful grace of God. I will eat at his table every single day because he redeemed me, because he picked me up out of the miry clay, because he set my feet on a rock. I will dwell in the house of God every single day. I will eat of his table every day. He will provide every single thing I need. And he will provide every single thing you need. I'm talking about a beautiful grace because our God is good. He operates in great goodness. And he extends beautiful grace to each and every one of us. Philippians chapter 4, verse 19 says this. And my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. And my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches in glory. Let that scripture settle in your heart because that's the grace of God right there. That's the grace of God working out into your life that God will supply all your needs. Say, Pastor, I still have needs. Pray about it. God is all sufficient. God is all powerful. God is all resourceful. He has everything you need at his fingertips. Sometimes all we need to do is just ask. It's just ask. My prayer this morning is that you will experience the beautiful grace of God even beyond salvation. Even beyond salvation. Maybe you have a need in your life. Maybe you're in a time, and, and all of us probably have been there in the last year, where we feel alone and isolated and quarantined. Maybe we're fearful and afraid. Maybe we're anxious and stressed out. But I want you to know that today God is calling you near. He has sent me, his servant, to come and get you from the house of Makir and Lodabar. And to tell you that the king has a message for you. He wants to draw you close. He wants to restore some things. He wants to speak to your heart today. And I want to ask you if you will to stand with me all over this house. Those of you who are watching on live stream, just stand in your living room, in the coffee shop, wherever you may be. Stand up right now. Because God's grace is sufficient for you. It doesn't matter how hard the struggle, God's grace is sufficient. Doesn't matter how sick you may feel in your body, God's grace is sufficient. However lost or undone you, you may feel, His grace is sufficient. If you're here this morning, you say, Pastor, I have some needs in my life that I just need God to shower His beautiful grace down upon me. I need to pray and have these needs met in Jesus' name. Would you step out from where you are as we sing this song? I want to pray over you. I want to pray over you. Because God's grace is sufficient to heal your body. 
God's grace is sufficient to provide finances, food, whatever it is you may need. You may need direction in your life. His grace is sufficient. He's sufficient this morning. Would you come? Where would I be? You only know. I'm glad you see through eyes of love a hopeless case, an empty place, if not for grace. Where would I be? If not, I want to ask some of our church to come and stand with these as we sing it again. Amazing grace.